Well, folks, um, my name is Roger Painter. I'm president of the Shawnee Caldwell Farmers Institute and Agricultural Society. That's a mouthful in itself. Um, I just want to welcome you to our wonderful facility here. The building itself is 101 years old. And uh, we have an addition that we're putting on right at the present moment. It was a uh, way of uh, celebrating the first 100 years. So just a little bit about the building itself quickly. Uh, the exits, in case you need to for uh, whatever purposes, there's the one on the side here which has wheelchair entrance and of course one in the back. The bathrooms are on the right hand side and there's a wheelchair accessible bathroom on the left at the back as well. So uh, anyone uh, needing facilities and so forth like that, that's for you there. Um, just a quick uh, bit about the College Hill Farmers Institute there. Uh, those are the things that uh, we're known for in the community, of course, is the fair, it's the Saturday, uh, we do a Christmas thing, and we have uh, you know, Easter egg hunts and so forth. So we're very much a community-based organization. Uh, we support ourselves just about fully uh, by donations and by uh, fundraising, such things as the fair, or the Saturday, rentals of the hall, we've got our own high, uh, production going right now and we're selling those and that's helping us uh, support the public and I think in a lot of ways maybe that's a, a place where I'm just going to end and make you think about for a moment this is as much as supported entirely by the community. It's not owned by government and it's owned by the <coughs> members of the society itself. So uh, maybe something for you to folks to think about while you're asking our uh, our candidates some questions. So. Uh, welcome today, and I uh, hope you enjoy our facility. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That's great. Yeah, so everyone, welcome to the All Candidates uh, debate here in South Calvin. I'm Dave Monday. I'm the president of the Chaudhry Basin Society. And uh, we're here to Basin Society, we'll give you a bit more information on that. We will through the BC uh, Coalition Institute, so you get to know those organizations. Um, our strong point in the Basin Society is uh, highlighting environmental issues that connect to South Calgary. So we wanted to bring the candidates and residents together with a collaborative vision um, that the well being of the communities are intertwined and reliant upon the success of all. So, Clean water is essential to our collective well-being. We must truly work together if we want to ensure the waters of South Cowichan are able to support future generations. We are very pleased to see so many engaged uh, attendees and citizens. Um, I'd like to thank the attendees, the candidates, and uh, the volunteers um, for your time today and our ongoing commitment to the community. So, we encourage everyone to attend their area-specific uh, candidate debates and utilize online resources for more detailed candidate platforms before casting uh, their ballots. And I, I encourage everyone, of course, to, to vote. Great. Uh, with gratitude, we acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish. These are the Hopamedan-speaking people. Uh, who have stewarded these lands for many generations. So I mentioned about the hall being 100 years old. That's, that seems like a long time, but uh, some of these, these generations go back thousands of years or so. Um, I'd like to explain the format. We're going to have um, each candidate will introduce, briefly introduce themselves, and they will answer a um, general question which they can give them. So that, we've allowed two minutes for that, so you can imagine that that gets politicians quaking in their boots. <laughs> it's not a lot of time, but anyway, and then what we have is a bunch of other questions. They, they've, uh, all the candidates are aware of these questions, but they'll be selected randomly. And, uh, and that will be a second question in another two minutes. So. And then, um, once we've had the five general questions and introductions to candidates, um, and we have a preset question. Then there will be a public uh, question period to follow. So we have the mic set up and uh, we'll look to your questions from the floor for the candidates. 
And the way we'll do that is we'll be asking questions by area, specifically by um, alphabetically, until our time is done. But we, we plan to uh, finish by 3 o'clock. Um, CDRD will be actually making a five-minute presentation regarding the referendum that they're holding as part of this election process. Now, as I understand it, the referendum deals with how to allocate costs for all the recreational facilities in the CBRD. And uh, there are a couple of models that, um, that they want you to choose between. So they'll give you more information on that. That will be five minutes sort of at the end of the uh, question period. So without further ado, I'd like to just give you a bit of information on, uh, on the Shawnee Basin Society. And uh, all I Yeah. This basically is an outline down the Shawnee Basin Society. Um, we were originally formed in 2012 under the guidance of Dr. Um, Bruce Fraser, and uh, he was previously an NRB director, and he um, set up a nonprofit society in 2012. And uh, it's carried on. Uh, eventually, he passed the baton to me. Um, recently, we uh, in 2021 we now um, we're incorporated as a federal charity. Okay, so easy. Get my timekeepers uh, coming to me off the stage here. <laughs> so anyway, I, I encourage you. This uh, slide tells it all that we're uh, we have expertise within the SPS that we can use and do use to uh, manage environmental issues within the watershed. So if you have any questions, we have an office in downtown Shawnigan Lake, uh, right across from the coffee shop. So we're open three days a week, uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 10 to 2. Come in, drop in, and you'll get more information on us. Thanks, Paul. So this then is the, uh, what we would call the mission statement of the society. So it, it really is focused on uh, health, long-term health and safety of the watershed. So that includes the land, the ecology, and the water. So I won't dwell on that. Um, at this point, I think we're looking at, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Big Newfeld and uh, Peter Ziello to come up and uh, just talk a bit about the PCCI. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rick. That's a little bit about a group called the BC Coalition Institute. There's a history behind that name, which I won't get into. But it's been going for about seven years now. We're a group of colleagues uh, in BC universities, most of them, and some community organizations. And you can read really what uh, that we're all about. We're linked to a, a national group called the Global Community. We can't hear you. We're linked to the Canadian Association of Global Health. Can you hear better? Yes, that's good. Um, and that's the sort of thing we do. We're a learning community, very interested in issues of equity, particularly interested in aspects of climate change. And uh, a few of us, here are myself, Laurie, and others, are a group from the BCCI that's now linked to the C. Yes, as a SBS as a partner. So I'll get here to say that we didn't think about that. Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming as well. So um, as Vic was mentioning, the BCCI or the BC Coalition Institute has um, expressed a need to have community partners uh, from the practitioners and researchers who are working on health equity issues and environmental issues. Um, on the research side um, and on the community side. So we uh, linked up with the Shawnigan Basin Society in Shawnigan. Uh, we have some connections here uh, to the land and we're building that partnership and we hope to uh, move forward um, in ways that we can bring in community members and bring in um, all the concerns that community members have um, to create a joint partnership between us. 
So, uh, for example, we'll be starting off a monthly series coming up in October where um, we'll be talking about sustaining healthy forests and invite community members to join it. So I'll pass it on to Bernie from here. Thank you. <laughs> so, as mentioned earlier by the president of this institute, the Trouble for the Farmers Institute, and the Hall of Group, and if anybody is interested in helping the Basin Society pay for the rent, we will gladly accept donations at the end uh, tables there, and if it's more than $20, we'll give you a tax receipt. Uh, so, we are starting out with, with the candidates introducing themselves and answering a general question. And the general question is what you see as the main environmental concerns in your area and why. And we'll start alphabetical with the introduction of general questions starting with area A to and then end up with E. And for the specific questions, we'll work from E back to A. You have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> keeping time, and the fellow here was supposed to be keeping time too. But what I will do, I'll put my hand up after one and a half minutes, and then I'll stand up after two minutes, and then I'll send Bernie over to take the <laughs> <laughs> As long as you don't shoot. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Paul uh, I was uh, raised in Duncan. Resale, a log in as we call it. 
how old. 30 minutes left. 30 seconds left. These kind of for-profit practices devastate neighboring water systems, ecosystems, and need to be addressed at the municipal level. I'll cut to the chase. Watchdog groups like the Shawnee Basin Society and the Mill Bay Conservation <coughs> Society, among others, play a key role in helping keep in check and influence provincial forest practices. Two minutes, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to I'll read grant funding to help these people. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> Coalition Institute for hosting this event. I want to acknowledge that we are on the lands now here and the whole CBRD on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, made up of 10 different nations. In my area, Mill Bay Malahat, I am grateful to the Malahat Nation and their ancestors for stewarding the lands I have the immense privilege to live on. The directors in the CBRD make decisions on how to use these lands, and it is my intention, if I'm elected, to make these with respectful communication with local First Nations. My name is Kate Segal, and I would like to earn your vote for Area Director of Melbourne Malahat. So, you're here to get to know me and my stance on issues, but what I see as the strongest part of being an Area Director is for me to know you. A successful Area Director is all about relationships. Relationships with community that have open lines of communication. Relationships with fellow board members, First Nations, developers, and CBRD staff that are functional and collaborative, and relationships with higher levels of government to advocate for the needs of our regional district. Relationships are a skill, and my power is in relationships. From family and neighbors, to government ministries, advisory commissions, and parent councils, I am an engaged and passionate volunteer in this community. It is through these relationships that I became aware of the most important environmental issue we face, water. As Vice President of the Mill Bay Community League, the first meeting I hosted on that topic is water. Being on the Advisory Planning Commission, I have provided oversight on development and regional plans to ensure our vulnerable aquifers are protected. I'm a, nu I'm a nutritionist and microbiologist, a COO, I host my own podcast, and I'm a proud mother of two boys. I'm highly organized, resourceful, and most importantly, I have the community connections to be a great area director for Mill Bay Malahat. Get out and vote. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming out today. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. My values continue to be love it, share it, protect it, and I first got involved at this political level with the community when we were fighting the contaminated soil dump. And then I found myself being Sonia Personnel's uh, alternate, and now today I am the director for Sonia Link. We've had many successes in the last four years, and I have a big list here, but I'm just going to pull out a few due to uh, the nature of time and our crowd here. Uh, one, we finished the Pink Shawnian Plan, which will help guide development in the village based on our community's mm -hmm. vision. And uh, because of this, we are already grant ready on multiple projects, and we have received one grant to date because of it. Another uh, thing to highlight is working at the board level, I was able to support policy change on soil dumping, including We've just revised it to include uh, restrict, restriction on the zoning where we can receive fill. So now we have even better control on soil dumping, and this is key in protecting our health of the lake. I've also supported uh, education campaigns on respectful use of the lake and milfoil management. And every month I communicate with the community, I write on my values of love and share protected. 30 seconds. <laughs> I hope uh, if you have any questions or you want to learn more about our community, go to islandshawnigan.com and I have blog posts, many, many, many blog posts there. And if you can't find anything, please contact me. Who I'm are you? Yeah. Yeah. Sierra. Sierra. <laughs> I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> I'm asked by the community to 
fun, and I'm really pleased at the encouragement that I've received so far. So that's pretty awesome. I have um, an extensive background in, in ecological matters. Um, uh, having read and, and studied the climate crisis for the past 22 years, I have a master's in environmental management from Royal Rose. I have lived in Shawnee Lake for 10 years now, have my own orchard and veggie gardens and berries, so I'm all too aware of what the climate crisis is doing to us in terms of the heat dome, the, the floods, the droughts, the wildfires. Um, so we really do need to work very quickly. There's a lot of work ahead of us. We have approximately eight years before the um, milestone of 450 parts per million is reached. Um, we're 421 right now, so there's a lot of urgency with regards to this matter. The immediate um, issues within this community relate to um, the jewel that, that is within our area, the Shawnee Lake itself, and the biodegradation that is occurring with that lake. Um, we have a, a lot of GHG spewing vehicles out on our roads, and, and more coming on every day. There's the clear cutting of our forests and the de degradation of our watersheds, um, degraded water systems, and we need to improve uh, agricultural practices to prevent the treatment runoff and of course food security issues. We need to be more self-sufficient. Um, I also want to say that I have a proven track record in terms of uh, ecological um, issues. Um, I've been with the, the Eco Forestry Institute Society. Um, we now steward wildwood eco forest. Um, also with the, the um, um, Couch and Valley um, Couch and Life Association, um, which provides mental free and affordable mental health services and also with Ferry Creek where I'm on the injunction team. Uh, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Wilson and my wife Barbara and I have lived in uh, the Coal Hill area for over 23 years and I am running for re-election in Area C, Cobble Hill. Um, two minutes is not very long, so I'm going to concentrate on the question, the question itself, which is what do I see as the main environmental concerns in my area and why? For years bordering on decades, the main environmental concern in our Cobble Hill gem has been the problems associated with business activities in the Fish Road industrial area. Why am I not being more specific? Why am I using less quick than precise phrasing? Simply put, I have been warned that legal consequences could be could arise should I identify anything specific to that area outside of official Carrollton Valley regional duties. Hence my reticence, and I hope you understand. <coughs> there are two problems that I am um, in Cobble Hill that I have concerns on. Problem number one. The air quality and associated odours that are omnipresent and emanate from the cobble, uh, from the Fisher Road industrial area. Why? Because those odours are so offensive or invasive that affected residents are forced to stay indoors with windows and doors closed. That may be tolerable during cold weather, but in the heat of summer, with perhaps no heat pump for cooling, or with elderly or very young, is that acceptable? It most certainly is not. Problem number two, the potable, uh, the potable water quality and associated nitrate and nitrate leachate that are present which may original from the Fisher Road industrial area. Why? Because protecting any watershed starts with protection of its source commodity, both quantity and quality. However, as a result of industrial activity in the Fisher Road industrial area, there is a past history and further potential for nitrate and nitrite presence in Aquifer 197. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Slade, and I'm hoping you will give me the opportunity to represent Cobble Hill at the CBRD board table for the next four years. I have lived my entire life in the South Coucher region and raised my family and four kids here in Cobble Hill. I spent my working life of over 40 years as a partner in the well drilling firm Drillwell Enterprises located in Duncan. 
I have 11 years service on the Caltrain Watershed Board and I'm the current treasurer. I have 23 years at the Mill Bay Fire Department with the past 16 years as board chair. I sat on the Cobble Hill Groundwater Advisory Group, which is not currently active. I am a past president of the BC Groundwater Association and I currently sit on the Cobble Hill Advisory Planning Commission. And I'm, in that role, I have been distressed to see some very recent commercial and residential developments pushed forward with no allowance for connecting paths, improvement to Fisher Road safety, or groundwater active for recharge. And just last week, as I watched the CBRD board meeting, several directors, including Director <coughs> Wilson, voted against a region-wide climate change adaptation strategy. Three of these five have stated publicly that they do not believe the science of climate change, and at least one has stated that we are doing enough. The science and the evidence all around us is telling us that we are facing a climate crisis. I believe that we must accept this fact and act like we really care about the future we are creating for humans and all other life forms around the planet. I am not sure that we can do enough, but I believe for the sake of our kids and grandkids, we should at least try. My main environmental concerns, development that does not respect the needs of the community or the needs of the natural support systems, groundwater monitoring and protection, air quality around Fisher Road, clear-cut logging on Cobble Hill Mountain, and for more information about me and what I believe, please visit my website, www.davidslade.ca. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, too, wish to uh, acknowledge that we're on the unceded territories of the uh, Coast Salish peoples. Um, my name is Hilary Abbott. Uh, we, my, my, my wife and two children, moved here from Ottawa in 1992 where I took up a job, a role at Shining Lake School as one of the fundraisers. By about 1997, I, I began to pursue a passion that I had uh, felt I wanted to run my own business. So I started with my family, uh, Hillary's Chief. It was an 18-year uh, success. And uh, we, we left the, the industry, we left everything about cheese in 2015. And then I went right back to Shining where they, uh, they took me back. So I was fortunate to get a job back. I'm now working part-time, and, and I feel it's, you know, why do I want to run for Area D, Cowichan Bay? The community has been fantastic to our family, but it's my time to get back. What's my environmental concern? My, basically, in two words, Fiona and Ian. We can see what's happening on the East Coast. What's going to happen on the West Coast this year? Last year, we had a, a, an atmospheric river pour through Cowichan. We saw the Coquihalla closed, we saw downtown Duncan almost uh, cut off, the, uh, the uh, Alamee Road is still impassable. If we don't believe that climate change is the number one environmental impact, and many, as we've heard, do not, that is where we have to put our efforts. The time for action is now. We can all do our part, and it's, it's, uh, it's well overdue. So I encourage you, as uh, my colleagues, I can, you can find more information about me at hillaryabbott.ca for college today. Thank you. Um, I am Allison Nicholson, 
Hamilton, I have been the director of RE for two terms, and I acknowledge with great respect and gratitude that we are on the Coast Salish unceded traditional territory. So I studied ecology, and I don't know how, I just literally fell into politics because of my work in the community and my concern that our local land use it was not a really very aligned with environmental protection. And I acknowledge after two terms it's been hard to make a difference. Which when I try and answer this question about environmental concerns leads me to say uh, that I think more about the people and the system we work within in terms of environmental protection than specific issues, although I do have one that I really care about deeply that I will talk about. So uh, my first concern is that our rules regarding land use and environmental protection are spread among multiple jurisdictions. So that means it's challenging to get staff time, resources, and the imperative to work collaboratively, really challenging to work collaboratively on issues. Situations have to become very dire, like the Cook's Island watershed, to attract the attention needed. The second concern I have is related to the first, and it is that we make many small land use decisions that are seemingly innocuous, but as they add up, they stress the ecosystem more and more, and then you layer on top of that climate change, and things begin to fall apart. The decision-making process that allows people's wants to be put before environmental protection is a concern. And then, of course, I am extraordinarily concerned about water and watersheds. I've got three big watersheds in Area E, the Shemanus, the Cowichan, and the Coast Isla. The Coast Isla is a poster child for everything that's wrong with how we manage watersheds, and that's what I focus a lot of my attention on. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So this uh, component, I reach into the park and pour a specific question that all of you candidates have been uh, exposed to. And we're going to start from area B e to A. And so the question I had pulled out is environmental issues and land use are controlled by various levels of government. With an eye to improving government government relations with First Nations, what training have you received or plan to receive and what plans do you have in place for improvement of relations with First Nations government bodies. Thanks, Bernie. When I was first elected, one of the first stops that I made was at Chief Seymour of Couch and Tribes' office. It's really super important to build relationships with First Nation people uh, on a personal level. And I, I do that at every opportunity. I take every opportunity. I've also been really fortunate to be on the Couch and Watership Board. And the Couch and Watership Board is a super important relationship, a partnership between Couch and Tribes and the, the CBRD. And I've learned a lot about walking together from being on the board. As well, I've taken several years of Okamina language classes. Super difficult to make the sounds, but I'm hearing words more and more when I hear it spoken. Um, if I'm elected, I will push for more effort by the CBRD to build meaningful working relationships with the Couch and Watership like the Couch and Watership Board with all the First Nations. We have nine, nine in the uh, region and so we need to really make an effort with everyone. And honestly, we will, are, will be a whole lot stronger together. Is this uh, my part? Yes. So the next question I pulled out is for the uh, next speak the candidate in the area D. Water quality of lakes and streams are governed by the activities that occur near these bodies of water. Activities such as forestry, farming, septic fields, and soil landfilling. Landfilling operations bring nutrient bearing sediment into the streams and lakes by watersheds. So, part A is how will you change the soil deposit by law to reduce the amount of sediment entering our water bodies? And right in the second part is why period areas provide many ecological functions. How would you promote the protection and restoration of riparian areas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like two questions. Um, 
from what I know so far, the soil pilots are already underway to try and help with this. So that's, that's one of the first steps to make sure we don't have any more contaminated soils being delivered. And as for the runoff, we need to make sure we have a way to catch the runoff and filter it so it doesn't end up in our water supply. And really meet the experts, talk to the experts. I'm not the expert on it, I'm not going to say I am. So it, the job for me is to make sure that we get the right things done for that and listen to everybody's concerns. Question, which is a repeat of the first question of full votes, but this this is how the rules were established. Environmental issues and land use are controlled by various levels of government, with an eye to improving government environment relations with First Nations. What training have you received or plan to receive? What plans do you have in place for improving the relations with First Nations? Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say my training with Aboriginal issues, First Nations. Bands has been limited at present. I look forward to opportunities that given uh, the chance to uh, represent the area of Heath Couch and Bay to learn more. However, during my time sitting on bodies like the Area um, Planning Commission and the Official Community Plan that won an award in the, uh, 2014, I worked alongside with members of the Couch and Band that were part of our, our successful award winning OCP. It's, it's uh, obviously a learning opportunity for anybody to work and learn from people who steward the lands so well. Uh, we, can take, um, we can learn much more and it, it, we're, I plan on doing so. Uh, the needs and plans for area T, uh, they must take in, they, we must take into consideration our closest and biggest neighbors, the couch and uh, So. That laterally, the Indians, <coughs> Couch and Tribes has hooked up to the um, to the Joint Utility Board. This is an encouraging sign that they're trying to deal with um, possibly failing septic systems, and they're engaged in talks with uh, new outfall for the uh, Joint Utility Board. All of these things would be great uh, opportunities for me to learn more about our neighbors and uh, uh, government government um, opportunities. Thank you. CBRD drivers concerning parks and trails is recreation. Do you think ecological concerns around parks and trails should be an important consideration? And what mechanisms do you propose for public input on the acquisition and management of parks and trails? Um, so the answer to the first part, do I think that, that ecological concerns should be an important consideration? Um, that's an absolute yes. Um, while I appreciate the recreational opportunities that are provided by our parks and trails, which I think need to be expanded greatly, I, I also believe that we need to um, take the opportunities that are presented to us to actually preserve places that are places where nature itself can uh, live and thrive. Um, I would like to see our parks acquisition fund fully funded. Unfortunately, there's been a battle at the CBRD table for the last several years where people have been trying to push that um, allowable $5 for $100,000 of property value, which would mean that someone with a million dollar property would cost $50 into the pot once a year that would generate more than $2 million throughout the region to purchase parks land. There's been a move by members of the CBRD board to push that below $1 for $100,000 of property value, which of course is enough to buy almost nothing. Um, so I would like to see that fully funded. Um, and uh, what mechanisms for public input? Well, the, uh, the Parks Commission for Cobble Hill has been more or less dormant for the last three years. Um, there has been little to no activity and from that group. I would like to revitalize that. I would like to make sure that we've got our entire community engaged in decisions as to how we advance parks, how we make our community more travel friendly. I would like to see more connected trails, more parallel paths. Um, there's been people talking about the possibility of starting small with a slash park somewhere in our community so that their kids can have some place to recreate in the ever increasingly long hot summers that we're all experiencing. So, so I think there's lots of opportunities to do much better throughout the region and here in Cobble Hill with our, with our
with our parks and our park plans. Thank you. So the next question I pulled out is the CBRD is experiencing both population increase and climate change while at the same time subject to a housing shortage with many areas experiencing aquifer depletion. What are your thoughts on how we can have both an increased population and an adequate drinking water supply as well as septic services? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Act 197, uh, that supplies the water to a majority of Coal Hill residents, is presently not contaminated and regular water uh, sampling testing done by the Coal Hill Improvement District indicates that all parameters meet the Canadian drinking water standards. The aquifer is also well stocked and replenished on an annual basis without being depleted. I have a graph here which shows well levels from 2011 to 2022 which clearly shows that Aquifer 197 is not in replenishment deficit. Unfortunately, this cannot be said of other uh, areas in South Carolina. The proposed, the proposed growth containment boundary for Area C, Cobble Hill in the MOCP is a good example of controlled housing growth which can be accommodated by our present aquifer levels and, replen and replenishment rates. As for septic services, Cobble Hill has one of the most advanced treatment plants in the CBRD, which is presently operating well below its design capacity. It therefore has built-in redundancy for future developments to be connected. And I will persuasively advocate to ensure that any new development has a modern treatment plant which meets all Canadian government standards if it cannot be connected to the present one. So at the moment we are planning for the housing uh, to meet what water we have and to protect what water we have. Thank you. So this is a um, question I hope at the last election the public approved a referendum to levy a $750,000 tax for drinking water and watershed protection. To date, very little has been done with these funds. What do you see as a good use for the drinking water watershed protection function for your area? In particular, many of the activities involving forestry and farming are outside the jurisdiction of local governments, but local governments may try to influence activities that impact the health of the watershed. How could the drinking water and watershed protection function be used to protect our watershed from harmful aspects of forestry and farming? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, the first thing that I will do is restore Function 488 of the annual $50,000 funding that has been designated for the Shonica Basin Society. It's the law. Um, I would also take a two-pronged approach. Uh, preventative, Can you speak up? Sorry, thank you. preventative measures and restorative measures. Um, preventative measures uh, at the source. For instance, we need to protect our forest. We need to, to preserve all our old growth, and we need to look at new methods of harvesting uh, second generation uh, forests. We need to um, instill a culture uh, among all woodlot owners, uh, private, private, and, and uh, corporate, um, to instill in them um, the fact that clear cutting our forests is no longer acceptable um, in this time of climate change. And, and proper stewardship of the lands. Um, Eco-forestry principles and practices, we also must look to the indigenous peoples and for their stewardship of, of the forest and land and, and how they have done that for millennia. Um, uh, regenerative agricultural practices need to be instituted. This involves uh, no-till, use of diverse cover crops, uh, on-farm fertilizers that reduce the need for outside fertilizers, multiple crop rotations, and managed grazing. Um, the improved soil is one of the top methods for sequestering GHG uh, emissions. Um, and, and we also need to look at them and restoration of watershed and riparian ecology. We don't we need to be ripping up the ecology, uh, the lake shore ecology that we have. We need to preserve what we have our intact system. Five 
five um, specific questions, so it's going to be a repetition. The question that I've drawn out is environmental issues and land use are controlled by various levels of government with an eye to improving government government relations with First Nations. What training have you received or plan to receive? And what plans do you have in place for improvement of relations with First Nations government bodies? Thank you for the question. Sierra, I'll introduce myself again. Um, I'm Sierra as far as training goes uh, with First Nations, I have had a little bit as an alternate, and then also from CBRD. And I also studied at Communum with Director Nicholson, so I'm ready to test her on that. Um, and, and I've built personal re relationships with First Nations throughout the island. As a community, we were gifted a pipe ceremony from a First Nations lady in um, uh, Port Alberni, and she brought a pipe ceremony to the community. And I've been invited to several um, sweat lodges and also a UAB. But when it comes to First Nations, all, it's just a matter of respect, and they always say, as long as you come with a good heart, then there, you really cannot go wrong. And building those relationships are really important, and they are important at the severity. They are our neighbors. And I look forward to one day when we don't even refer to First Nations as a, another community or a next door community. I think we, we, I, I look forward to when we're all just one and there's no differentiation. <laughs> That throws you off. Anyway, thank you. So the question I pulled is water quality of lakes and streams are governed by the activities that occur near these bodies of water. Activities such as forest food farming, septic food, and soil landfilling. Landfilling operations bring nutrient bearing sediment into the streams and lakes of our watersheds. How would you change the soil deposit by law to reduce the amount of sediment entering our water bodies? One question. And the second is, riparian areas provide many ecological functions. How would you promote the protection and restoration of riparian areas? Thanks for the question. So, in July of 2020, the board voted to approve a number of soil deposits in Shawnigan Lake and one in the Hat area. There is no public consultation for soil deposits. And the staff advised the board to approve since it just met all the requirements of the soil deposit bylaw. Now, local area directors, Sierra Acton and Blaze Salmon spoke up that the community did not want those soil deposits and they voted against it. But the rest of the board voted for it. Solid relationships between board members are really crucial in this instance to be able to stand up for our local communities. I will work hard to build strong relationships with other board members so that they can understand how their vote can support Milne Malahat, and I prefer to have public consultation. <coughs> For the riparian areas, they are protected by provincial legislation. All developments need to have a riparian area assessment. And in terms of riparian areas that have not been respected in the past, there are many community groups that I would support that can work with landowners to restore riparian areas. Groups like the Mill Bay and District Conservation Society, who have put a lot of work into the Shawnigan Creek salmon habitat and last year alone brought back 7,000 coho to the creek. Thank you. Okay, the CBRD is experiencing both population increase and climate change while at the same time subject to a housing shortage with many areas experiencing effort for depletion. What are your thoughts on how we can have both an increased population and adequate drinking water supply as well as some adequate septic services? Well, one of the things that, that I come across all the time is people trying to run their sprinkler system or water their gardens <laughs> in these areas and they're using the treated water already. Like, so why are you using your drinking water when you could be using water that you caught off your roof. Years ago, there was a CBRD funded uh, program for 
recycling or uh, composting bins. Uh, we could do something similar like that, uh, probably a, a funded program, even a temporary one, to see how it works to catch rainwater and provide bins, subsidized uh, catchment bins for people, at least so they can water their plants and not use the treated water from the system and it still goes back into the to the earth. We're just rerouting it temporarily. Another another area in that in that topic is these dual flush toilets. How come we don't all have dual flush low volume toilets? It seems like a real waste of perfectly good drinking water, treated water in a lot of these systems to just flush. A big flush. A lot of older homes too. So these are, are important issues that we, we could be looking at. There might even be uh, government funding to help in this area because it's, it's a huge issue. The climate change and where our water goes, decreasing water supplies. I think it's a needed conversation. Thank you. At the last election, the public approved a referendum to levy a $750,000 tax for drinking water and watershed protection. To date, very little has been done with these funds. What you see is a good use for the drinking water and watershed protection function for your area. In particular, many of the activities involving forest and farming are outside the jurisdiction of local governments, but local governments may try to influence activities that impact the health of the watershed. How could the drinking water and watershed protection function be used to protect our watershed from harmful aspects of forced food in front of them. Thank you for the question. Uh, one of the problems when dealing with watersheds, aquifers, is data. All the data that we use at the moment has no bearing in that climate change, our storm intensities, our frequencies of storms actually impacts how we collect our water that we need to live. After two months, everyone will go out to their garden and if you scrape the surface, it's just dust. The first storm will come, you scrape the surface. The water is only, I mean the soil is only wet, maybe a quarter of an inch. The rest runs off. As we get higher intensity, less frequent storms, the recharge of our aquifer totally changes. The water that comes in our storms runs quickly down through our streams, flooding everything, as we have all experienced, ending up into the oceans before it can be retained for our future use. So what we are going to experience is something that this uh, 750,000 is probably out of date because in the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, we have sea level rise which will impact the Cook's Island, the Couch and River Basin, the First Nations uh, islands there. We will have water um, in the Couch and River that may actually dry up because the intensity is at the wrong time of the year. We have to actually look at this issue. Thank you. So we come to the uh, part of the program where we have questions from the floor. But what we would like to do is rotate the questions from area to area. So if anybody has a question for area A candidates, please come to the microphone and ask your question. I don't have a question, but I just managed to have two minutes again to answer. Two minutes again, yeah.
And for that to happen, the people need to be involved. It goes all the way up to provincial and federal levels, and the only way stuff gets done is if people get out, boots on the ground, and make a noise. It's important. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here because you're here today, but I need you to go home and take that message to your neighbor, your friends, and say, hey, this is what's going on. What do you think? Just have a conversation about it and see what they say. Uh, as for the other item, uh, do your research. Go look up heart, look up some of these things, and make your own decision. Be aware. Like anything, you need to do your own research. It's just not enough. People aren't going to feed it to you. You have to look for yourself. So do yourself a favor and look into what's going on. Don't just follow the narrative. Yeah, I think this is a sensitive issue since this involves Malahat Nation lands and it's important to respect Indigenous sovereignty. That said, I have a friend that lives in the Malahat Nation and he feels that the Malahat Industrial Corp has not been communicating well with the members of the nation and representing what they want to happen on the lands that extend all the way through Bamberton. There is a lot of logging, there is a quarry application, there is a foreshore expansion application and how many of you knew about any of those things? One. <laughs> a couple. A couple. Yeah, yeah. Small handful, right? So our public isn't informed. And that's because it hasn't been in our local newspapers. Our local area directors haven't been telling us about it. Those open lines of communication are so important. But there is a local group, the Sanitary Inlet Protection Society, that has been paying attention. And there are people contacting the Ministry of Mines to make sure that environmental assessments are being followed through on. So this really is so important that the public is involved and speaking up. Those areas also are all zoned industrial. So being a part of the talks around our new harmonized official community plan, there's, more, there's an event happening here on November 5th. Make your voice heard if you don't want those lands to be zoned industrial. The climate change, uh, let's like, think about the scope of area directors. Area director, I would be really focused on you, the people that actually live here, on making sure that you have a sustainable water supply, that your aquifers are being recharged, that there are, that developers are being held accountable so that they have systems in place to deal with what wells going dry if there's a pump test, so that we have 10, 20 years down the line, money set aside so that we can actually have a sustainable water supply. Um, make your local voice heard. Speak up. Thank you. She would restore the funding for Function 488, which is the Shawnee Basin Society, which lost our funding five years ago because uh, you, Sierra, did not um, renew it or you zeroed us out. Can you please explain the why you did that? Well, we're going to have environmental questions. So. But that's an environmental question. Seriously. <laughs> My name is Russ Lyon. I was born in Duncan and raised in Shawnee Lake, and we own property.
Wow. It's my understanding that under, under Function 488, um, that $50,000 a year is mandated to go to the Shanghai Basin Society. This was explained to me personally by Dr. Bruce Springer, who was the area director who put that, that, that designation into place. There were, I don't understand that there were exemptions <coughs> for that. There's nothing I believe that is, um, that states that certain criteria, such as rent or whatever must be met. The, the purpose of the $50,000 was so that the Basin Society could monitor the watershed, which is a critical um, aspect uh, for our community and is not to be overlooked by simply withdrawing that funding and employing it elsewhere. Thanks, Area B, so now I have to wait. Area C, questions? <laughs> Um, so I wasn't going to come today until I got a mail and said she was applying for some probable mail and was going to clear that. Um, which I believe was in one of the area directors' mail. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to come today um, until I read in the mail that 90% of probable mail was going to be clear cut. So I would like to know where that percentage came from, is my first question. And maybe I'll give a little bit of background. So I'm a license holder of one of the lots of public mountain. So I've got factual information of what's happening on public mountain. I can guarantee you it's not 90%. Like question. So where did the 90% come from? So do you have a number? I do. Yeah. Okay. So real briefly here. Public mountain consists of a total of, uh, what have we got here? Cory Nature Park is 26 acres. They have provincial forests of 450 acres. After woodlots of 550 acres, meaning that 53%, only 53%, is by small scale sustainable forestry, not 90%. That's the question. The question is are you going to carry on making misstatements to mislead the population and the public, or are you going to do factual research and provide fact based information? so that people can make an informed decision. Um, so thank you for the question, Keith. Um, as you know, I've, I've told you that I have a tremendous amount of respect for you, your family, and your stewardship of the Crown Woodlot license that you hold. I think that you are doing the best job possible. But what I have said is I have said that less than 10% of the area that most of us consider to be Cobble Hill Mountain Park and Recreation Area has got any formal protection. And so that's what I would like to see. I would like to see formal protection to most, if not all, of Cobble Hill Mountain. As you know, most of Cobble Hill Mountain is Crown Woodlot. 90% of Cobble Hill Mountain is Crown Woodlot. And the remainder is under an interpretive force designation by Parks and Recreation BC. Yes, and it has no formal protection. It is not a park. It is a Crown Woodlot license that is not currently hold by any license holders. That could be changed with a stroke of a pen. So I would like to see formal protection for the area that we love so much that is a cornerstone of this community, not just for Cobble Hill, but for Shawnee Lake and Couch Bay, people come from Victoria and Nanaimo to recreate in this area. It is a wildlife refuge. I would like to see it given formal protection. And 90% of it has no formal protection. 90% of 50% is very different than 90% of 100. No, excuse me. I'm all for respectful dialogue, but we cannot have people just yelling from the crowd. That's what you're saying. Um, I'm going to read from an email um, which was sent by Mr. Slade to a number of people, which says, I just got off the phone with David Paul, um, David Paul of Limrod, reviewing a uh, proving officer of the Cobble Hill Mountain Woodlot, number uh, WO22. 
I have to apologize for spreading incorrect information. And then the last one is, my apologies for my part in spreading confusion. I just fully understood the status of the woodlots this morning. There's the apology for spreading confusion and for misinformation right here. There is a lot of confusion going on. There is a lot of misinformation being spread around. There is misinformation being spread about by, on, my, on my behalf as well. I'm a climate denier. Supposedly, I am not. Leave it at that. Thank you. My name is Jeff Strong. I'm an atmospheric and uh, climate scientist, so that will tell you where the basis of my question. We've seen enough weather events all around the world in the past year, past two years, to know that we're in a climate crisis. So my question to my area D, where I reside, uh, candidates are, what would you promote within South Club Coalition and, and CBRD to help um, resolve the climate crisis. We can't resolve it on our own, but it has to start at the local level. What would you do to help, for example, reduce carbon emissions? Thank you for a very timely question. It's a multifaceted answer. Uh, we all have to do our part. It means driving less. It means making bus routes a little bit more accommodating. Area D, like a lot of uh, regional districts, or parts of our region, uh, people live in homes far from the current bus uh, routes. We've got to find ways to uh, call on demand, get people to the communities that want to shop, work, or play in by uh, come reaching out. That would be one thing. Walkable and uh, cyclable pathways that are interconnected, getting people down into the village. Often you hear that the, the village is inaccessible due to the, the parking. It is a bit of a wild west for them, but better pathways might encourage more people who can cycle to come on into the village and leave the car at home when possible. Uh, encouraging people to get off uh, the older style of fuel systems and as they heat their houses out, warmth, warming our houses is, is another big contributor to global warming. So heat pumps, we're, we're blessed in British Columbia to have hydro uh, energy, and we, the more we can incentivize that is uh, getting people to, to do uh, their part. The list goes on. It's a very good question, and I hope it's on top of everybody's mind as we just about enter, uh, we enter the uh, heating season. Yeah.
effects of radiation coming through. There's been a lot of signs and documents stating that it's not healthy for us. We don't want it. So what's your guys' viewpoint? I was hoping I'd get a few minutes to think about that one. <laughs> uh, 5G cell towers uh, was not a part of my extensive research in preparing for this. Um, I think that technology is advancing. 5G is being used elsewhere around the world. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about how it's affecting our health, um, but I believe in technology. There's actually a lot of science around health. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I would have to say one of the jobs of an area director is to voice the concerns of the people and not your personal opinion, but this is something that is very personal to me and just for health reasons alone, I have followed the science and I could back up the science and I would have to say we don't need any more of that stuff going on.
Thank you for your question. I wouldn't uh, say it's filled with a lot of uh, accurate information, but I will answer it as close to possible. Phase one and phase two, the section that has already been built, has been a huge success. And as the area director, my role is to represent the whole community, not just a small group of people who are against a project. Um, and I can guarantee you at the CBRD level that uh, I will ensure that best practices are followed just as in one and two. And I, I don't see in this room today the kids who live in the village and a lot of the seniors who live in the village, and I've received countless letters, people who show up and have a coffee and walk along the, beside the railway trail. And you know what? I'm here to represent them to not just the loudest who are against the project and spread information that's not true about it. We had more environmental um, studies on that area than I've ever seen on any project at the CBRD. Okay, next question, it's area C. away that we would not force people who can afford an RV 
but can't afford a place to put it. So is it on a larger residential lot, a half acre lot, a three quarter acre lot, of which there's plenty in Cobble Hill? We could allow people to live in those where they, while they wait for some accommodation that they could actually afford to own and live in. I would like to see us push developers to put in suites in the houses that they're building on selling on the newly approved residential lots. I would like to see some percentage of them actually have suites built into them as a requirement of their approvals. I would like to see us see some more duplexes. I would like to see us densify our communities and find a way to help the couch or the Cobble Hill Improvement District um, get their water supply up to par so that we can have multi-family housing developments in Cobble Hill. So I think that there's lots that we can do as local government to make more housing stock and to make that housing stock more affordable for the people that we need to come to our community to fill the jobs that are here. So, and, and to staff the fire department. Thank you. Um, but they fit together. So um, it kind of 
address is the heart of Mill Bay, which has really been uh, over the years transected by the Trans Canada Highway and apprehended by Brentwood School. So we now, as Mill Bay residents, don't really have any access to our, our shorefront. Um, I understand there might be a little property that still hasn't been scooped up. So I guess part of it would be my question is around that. And the second is on the other side of the highway, as everybody knows, we had a huge fire. The Pioneer Mall is no longer there. I kind of understand that there's uh, plans in place. I don't know at what stage these plans are and whether there is room for community involvement in terms of access across the highway and hopefully the shorefront and, and um, sort of you know, recreational spaces incorporated into that. Um, and also um, community housing, like what are the plans for some you know, infill community housing there? Because I know on my road, we have a lot of people living in trailers now that are accepted. Big question, thanks. So uh, I'll go right to where the fire was first, what I know about that. So uh, I know that there's a big development slated for that, and I don't think there's anything firm on that, and there is uh, a residential component in there. With all these projects, it's always uh, evolving, and the fire is a uh, bit of an issue. There's still some cleanup to do there, and there's some talk that there may be some fuel tanks underneath there because it used to be a gas station. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, the remediation time will will be quite quite a while before anything happens there. But there, there's more than one phase to that project. So uh, I know the community is quite involved in that and what they want to see, but. Uh, as far as I know, there's no real firm proposal or anything to look at that's, that's firm. Um, it would be great if there was uh, another bit of park in there that got us down to the water more. Uh, I don't know that that's happening yet. Uh, but all the input and uh, stay informed and make the voice known of what you want to see with the board. Thanks. Brentwood College and advocate that Mill Bay, Malahat, 
means access to the ocean. Um, Pioneer Square Mall, a few weeks ago, I met with Blaze Salmon and the owner of Limona Construction, which owns Pioneer Square and the whole Stonebridge development behind there. Uh, Pioneer Square, it is, it is a full development that has all been approved by the board years and years ago, but it's held up based on water license approval. Pioneer, the Pioneer Square building does have water approval, and it could go ahead right away, but there's a lot of highway improvements that would be required to extend the left turn lane, and the plans are for commercial on the bottom, residential on the top. They also are approved for government subsidized housing, so that would be true affordable housing coming to our community. Back into the rest of the Stonebridge development, that does include seniors housing, and uh, mixed not only just single family homes, but townhouses, so that we can have not just million dollar homes <laughs> available for us the elite few. Thanks. Questions? <coughs> I'm not actually sure if Kings of Lake is in B or C, but since I live in B, I'd like to ask a question. Um, what do you believe is the, the best land use solution or solutions uh, for that for the quarry? And are you satisfied with the amount of information that has been provided to the public about where discussions are at and what options are being considered? This quarry is in which area? Yeah, I mean, the quarry is privately owned and is currently off limits uh, due to uh, a, a very disastrous and very sad fatality that happened there. So I, I am not aware of what's going on. Um, and, and there has been no information and that's been forthcoming about negotiations between uh, CBRD and the private owner. At least there's been nothing publicly made available that I'm aware of. And I would just like to add an addendum to my last question in response to the rail trail issue. There was a petition uh, against the rail trail that, garnered, that has now garnered 1,517 signatures which goes way beyond the, the few loud voices in the immediate neighborhood. <laughs> significant community response. That's even more than the people who voted in the last election. So this, this is really a, a tremendous concern to the community. Uh, where is that gentleman? I just wanted to see him. Oh. Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, Kimsick Lake is, is uh, the quarry lake, and the, I know that the community really values it. And uh, one of the questions of Times Calmness was they asked for some big goal, and I put that as a big hairy audacious goal to uh, acquire the quarry. Uh, how that could happen is, um, well, first of all, it has been written about a few times in the Focus newspaper, and I've uh, written a couple blog posts as well about the quarry, and I've spoken with the owners, it is privately owned uh, two brothers who live in Prince George. Uh, they have, in, in order for the community to acquire, acquire it, probably our only way that will happen is through development if they go to rezone it. It is identified in our uh, regional parks master plan, so that allows us to act quickly if it ever uh, was small enough to go up for sale, or it also gives us the permission that the community is interested in uh, exploring that option and, and how that would work. So uh, they are very well aware that the community is interested in it, and I've approached them before my term, during my term, and there's just no interest at this moment uh, on, on their part to make that a priority. And, uh, and even that said, there, the property has some issues. It would be uh, a challenge, but it, I, I even tried uh, just saying to them, could we just talk like talk about it in a creative way? Maybe uh, I kind of imagined uh, small mini homes there for like a mountain bike community, and you would have a mini home and, and a small uh, storage space because there's so many trails and networks in there. 
and you, you have the, uh, the quarry part. So uh, one day, I think, in our uh, greater community vision, it will be realized. Area C. Waiting for other people to step up. So, so my question then doesn't have to do with the rising sea levels or anything like that. It's more a practical question. I live in Colorado Hills down the road here, and um, I'm wondering why we don't have street lights. I asked this question a few years ago, and they said, well, we asked the residents, and they said we have to pay for it, and it's quite a bit extra that we have to pay for that. So, like my taxes have doubled in the last few years. And I don't use sewer, I don't use water, I don't have garbage picked up. My roads are not that great, but I know that's the provincial government. Uh, there's a park down the road here that's used in the summer for music uh, a few times in the summer. And I see people working down there, I see a lot of money going into that place. Uh, is it really, is it, you know, in the interest of safety, is there anything that you guys could do, like as an area C director, to help us? Get street lights, or is it is it true that the people just don't want them? Or maybe there's like light coming in at night or something like that. It seems to me like for a little community, we should we should be able to go for a walk at night when it gets dark here by what 4:30 or something like five o'clock. You know, anyways, that's the question. But. Street lights. Uh, I hadn't planned on that one, but. Uh, but I, uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, to my knowledge, um, improvement districts have got the ability to be created for fire departments, for water districts, and for streetlights. And in fact, I think that was one of the first things that improvement districts were created for. So it is certainly possible that an improvement district could be created in Cobble Hill or throughout the region. Um, and you know, there are people who think that streetlights are a terrible idea because it it's light pollution, um, but there are new downward facing solar power lights that, that are you know, more reasonable and more effective. Um, I would like to see us have improved uh, trails and, and pathways that would make it safer for us to navigate the roads, which in many of the roads in Cobble Hill, Cobble Hill Road for example, um, right from the highway right through to the highway again is like running a gauntlet if you're riding a bike or pushing a baby carriage along there. Um, uh, I think that those are really, really important priorities, but I would encourage, I mean, if you and your neighbors feel that that um, street lights are really important, that they do come with a cost, but that cost is usually borne by by the improvement district that's created to, uh, and, and the community, the, however big or small that community is, that's served by that improvement, just like a fire department or, or a water district. Um, so an interesting question worthy of consideration. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear moving forward if there's a uh, if there is a group of people that would really be interested in pursuing it. I would certainly support them if there was. Yeah, an interesting question. That one. I would um, I'd advise against um, yet another layer um, of um, approval in another district. Uh, improvement district or not, we've got enough layers of government and committees and everything else. We can do this through the CDRD. If there is a, a desire and a, and a real need for that and people want it, yeah, we can work on that. I don't see why not. As uh, has been pointed out, there is there are some downsides to it as far as light pollution is concerned, but those are problems that can be overcome with downward facing lights. Uh, and so power, so it's, it's certainly doable by all means. And uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to explore it further, but without the creation of yet another layer of government of some kind. Thank you. Area B, questions? And 
where we actually have a sense of community. So on the OCP for Cow Bay, um, there was a thing in there about cluster housing, which works great because being a senior, getting older, your abilities are less, you're limited more. Um, we're looking for a sense of community. And that's why we have a lot of snowbirds who go down to Arizona and other places, because there is down there. They go to communities that have um, community calls on in your complexes, a, a workshop, um, community activities within a senior community that they're looking for. We don't have a cohesive community in Couch and Bay, not for our kids. And I live in Walton Crescent, really awesome neighborhood, and a house where families should be there. But there's nowhere for me and my husband to move to so that we can pass this house on to a family so they can go to Bench Row, which is an awesome school. And the Cow Bay Village down below, it totally sucks. It's directed solely towards tourists, not towards us um, taxpayers up top to send our tax dollars down there to keep that place going. So, you know, where's this housing? Where's the plan for our housing as we plan to live in place as we age because there's also no um, great plans for um, long hair term for us in a few more years. It's crowded out there. So anybody up there can ask another question. <laughs> Thank you for the pertinent, timely, and important question, Laura. Met Laura and Rob yesterday. They, they tracked me down on the road as I was door knocking. I appreciate it. We did talk about this. It's on the minds of many people. It, it, we talked about affordable housing earlier uh, and young people getting into the houses. Encouraging news out of the province uh, last week that they are focusing on housing and densification. Uh, I, I went merrily to the CBRD and I said, I want to put a tiny home on my property and was promptly told, you may not. So I think I think options need to be considered. We, we, uh, the in-law suite is, is an option. Tiny homes could be a suite. You live in a neighborhood with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of larger homes. Of course, people are going to be concerned about cars. It's already ripping through the community of Oak Bay. What's going to happen with a house that had one family now has four? So we we have to, these, these plans have to be developed in concert with other thoughts, walkable, um, walkable communities, and trying to get people to use fewer cars. I, I would think the average person in this room probably had more than one car. Um, at the beginning of COVID, we got rid of a car, and we, we jumped into e-bikes. I can do that still. That's not necessarily something that some of the doors have knocked on is possible. But you raise a valid question. As far as college and base sucks, um, I think we're all in this together. Let's see if we can improve it. And we need some more resident associations that, that get together and find the things that are, sh that, that are short. You've got a, a nice little mall up near the fire hall. More services that are, are useful to people living in College and Bay need to be developed. Uh, the uh, Valley View Center is not part of our area, but certainly College and Bay residents enjoy the amenities of College and Bay at uh, Valley View Center. Thanks, Laura. As a realtor, lots of people look at me as a developer, which is not the case. I just like helping people like yourself find a home that works for you. Uh, out in uh, Lake Cowichan, they have a really nice development that has thousand square foot townhouses, and it's a 45 plus, and people love it. And retire there. Something like that would be great for Cowichan, Maine. Whipple Tree area, it's pretty much a ghost town. I think that would be possibly a really good spot for a year-round fire market and affordable housing. Uh, the OCP, you can't believe everything you read in that because when I read it, it says that a young family making 100 grand a year can afford a house, a single family, detached house in Couch and Bay. 100 grand a year gets you maybe $300,000 house, which if you can tell me where those are, I'd love to find them because I got lots of families that are trying to find homes. So. The OCP needs to get overhauled, even though they only just did it a year ago, because the data is just not right. So it's uh, a big thing to help with people and get affordable housing. Area A. Anyone have a question for Area A?
Thank you. And I really want to thank all of the candidates for participating today, and especially uh, in my area A, because I came here not knowing who to vote for, and I'm still not sure. But um, and I, I have Paul, so, but I've been taking notes. Paul, I don't have your last name. I just wrote down Paul W. Paul. What is it? Paul Paul. Thank you. My name is Michael King St. Clair. I'm the past president of the CMS Food Bank, and I'm currently on the board of the CMS Food Bank. And um, we have seen, due to inflation, which is not your fault, I'm not accusing anyone on the state of that, but um, we have a lot of families that are struggling. We have new families that uh, we see. Tuesday is Hamper Day. It's also the first uh, day of for hampers for the month of October. During COVID, I delivered several hampers to many, many families. Um, it is a misnomer to believe that the individuals, that all of the individuals that use and participate in the food bank um, are renters or homeless in South Carolina. Many, many are homeowners. And they are seeing, I have a question at the end, thank you for not spending <laughs> Uh, many are seniors, and many of them are young families that we have never seen before that are being hit with groceries and also with um, uh, high gas prices. This I received in the mail on recreation bond. These people cannot afford gas in their tanks, so they're not going to be able to afford to pay for additional recreation use that they may or may not use. So, I am going to ask if you would please um, answer my question, either a yes or a no. Are you for this a tax increase on homeowners or are you against it? And I thank you very much for your question. this question. Thank you very much. So, I'll uh, address the food part first. Uh, the other day I was just driving through the valley like I always do, and there on the side of the road was a, just a little stand with three vegetables. This person had an extra from their garden and they just wanted to share and take it home. Awesome idea. I myself have an orchard. I have way more apples than I could ever use or give away. So, if if the food bank uh, has more information or can put it out there to people like, like myself or anybody else that has produce and how we can get it to you, uh, that would be a really great idea because there is food here. We do accept, we do accept produce. Okay, okay. Very, 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 very generous. On the issue of the referendum, which a lot of people don't, are not aware of, That's right. um, most areas are going to see quite a substantial increase and I know John is going to talk about this in a few minutes I'm just waiting to get up here but what do we get for that we don't get any more for that we pay more and I think there's still money in the in the financial statement that I saw that could defray this so I'm a no but I think that's, I think the idea is to mean well, uh, the, the play fair and everything, but I think we need to go back to the board and talk to the people some more, take the input, maybe look at a few more years of the data that they